All right, so let's go ahead and start and reward those who are here. At, at the I'm good. Well done, John. By the way. I that was pretty good. So I see you before it's real. So I am, I'm giving an introduction. Of, it's only 10 minutes. No, it's not yet. <laughs> but actually, so, um, so Dr. McDaniel, I received her uh, undergraduate degree in communication disorder at the University of Virginia, which is in a town about the size of Florence, by the way. <coughs> yeah, haven't been here. Has a similar number of hills. Similar number of hills. Um, let's see. A master's was at Vanderbilt in 2012, right? Mm -hmm. And then she was employed uh, at Chuck Ch Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Massive hospital, right? As big mm -hmm. as they come. From 2012 to 2015. And then she began the doctoral program at Vanderbilt in 2015. And you, when did you defend your dissertation just the other uh, February week? 26th. Two weeks ago, is that what yeah. it was? Mm -hmm. So this is a newly minted uh, <laughs> PhD if there ever was one. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that's good. All official now. So, um, and I think the first time I met you, you were considering whether you wanted to, you were going to go to Vandy or maybe come to KU. And so we lost that one, but we're going to win now. Yeah. That's our goal. So, um, uh, just a couple of things that I, I, I want to say about her, uh, for those of you who haven't seen her. She is really remarkable. Um, so she has been an author this early age in her career on 11 peer-reviewed publications. She's been the first author on seven of those. It's ridiculous. It's really nice. <laughs> uh, and she's got three more papers in review. It's pretty cool. Um, and let's see, I counted 40 posters and presentations, and she was the lead author in over half of those, so she, she's busy. Um, we're delighted to have her here, considering uh, joining us as a postdoc at KU. And the title of her talk today is that title right here: <laughs> Evaluating the Validity of, of Vocalization Measures for Assessing Vocal Development in Young Children. Right. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Well, I'm excited to be here and to present to you my dissertation work, and we run vocalization measures in young children with the spectrum disorder. And before I go um, into that line of work specifically, I want to give a brief review about how my research questions developed and why the questions I seek to answer are so important to me. So since first learning what autism spectrum disorder was and working with children with hearing loss in high school, I've had a deep desire to help those children uh, communicate. And that deep desire has led me on a cross-country training adventure, uh, which I heard a little bit about in the introduction, um, to be able to ask and answer clinically relevant questions about how to better serve children with disabilities and their families. And so when I worked clinically um, at the uh, University of Virginia through research studies as well as schools for children with autism and spectrum disorder, I constantly faced questions about whether what I was doing um, was working. I wanted to know how we knew that interventions worked and how I would know if something else would work better. And so I took those questions and wrestled with them um, at Vanderbilt University, where my master's degree in speech language pathology, um, and I wrestled with them through coursework and clinical and research experiences. And then when I was working with children again at Children's Hospital of Colorado and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, I was again faced with questions with what was I, uh, whether what I was doing was helping that child. So were these services helpful? How could I modify them to increase the likelihood or magnitude of success? So what were these different features that really mattered for intervention? And so I would dive into the literature and try to find articles. I would ask senior clinicians, but too many times I was frustrated with having to tell either myself or my colleagues or families that we didn't know. We didn't have the answer about whether that intervention is likely to be more successful or how we can modify it to increase its effectiveness. And so those questions are what brought me back to Vanderbilt University for my PhD to start answering some of those questions. And my research line has continued to focus on children with autism spectrum disorder as well as children with hearing loss and, and continue to ask those clinically relevant questions. How do we know what works? And during my time, I've learned from Dr. Shealy and Dr. Yoder and other mentors about the importance of asking foundational questions for intervention research and how to have a thoughtful and strategic plan for those studies to increase the likelihood that the results will be meaningful to the field. And ultimately, we have to be able to change the way that speech language pathologists and other professionals interact with children with disabilities and their families to cause positive change. And so that motivation and, and that kind of view is what informs my intervention program and my programmatic line of research. And today I'll be presenting the overall motivating rationale for my dissertation work um, with vocalizations, the purpose of that study, the method used to answer it. I'll then present the results and try to tie them together for you within the discussion and then give a few pieces of future directions in the, in the near future. 
Before going uh, too far, I'd like to give a brief review about autism spectrum disorder for those of you who are less familiar. Autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disability that's characterized by restricted and repetitive behaviors or interests, as well as deficits in social communication. And those deficits in social communication can span a wide range of severity levels. I also want to give a brief review of vocal development in children with typical development before talking about vocal development in children with autism spectrum disorder. So for children, we expect them to progress through a number of different stages across the first 12 months of life. So initially, they're producing quasi-vowels that eventually become fully resonant. Around that same time, they're producing um, raspberries or lip trills and squeals and growls and grunts. And then around five to 10 months of age, they hit this critical point where they produce canonical syllables. And those are produced with a vowel-like um, sound and a consonant-like sound with a rapid adult-like transition between them. So often it's reduplicated at first, so the same consonant vowel, la la la, da da da, and then over time becomes variegated, where the consonant or vowel changes, ah ba da pa, where they're changing and those sounds across. And I'm going to play one of my favorite videos that demonstrates canonical babbling. And so let me see if I can start it here. You may have seen this in popular press a few years ago. <laughs> So, there's two twins that are producing canonical babbling. <laughs> Alright, I could watch that for a very long time. <laughs> I'll stop there. Um, so, they're producing that same syllable da over and over again, um, with inflection integrated with facial expressions and gestures in a clearly communicative manner. Um, and so, that's um, an example of that canonical babbling. And then around their first birthday, children are expected to produce their first words. And then across the second year of life, we expect them to increase their expressive vocabulary, but still be producing some babbling within that time. So it's referred to as gibberish or jargon. And, and so that's kind of the framework that we're thinking about for children with physical <coughs> development. For children with autism spectrum disorder, we can think of a number of different reasons to assess and target vocal development within this population. So it could be more effective to target vocal development rather than linguistic or grammatical targets, at least in the stage where they're in the early stages of communication development. So they might not be ready for those um, semantic targets or those uh, grammatical targets. We could also use vocal development as a way for indicating early response to intervention. So as we talked about for children with typical development, we expect a number of months before we hear spoken words, but they're indicators of progress along the way. So for children with autism spectrum disorder, there might be indicators of vocal development that you could use to predict whether that child is on track for producing spoken words or whether there needs to be a change within their intervention plan. So thinking about canonical syllables or their use of consonants. Vocal development might also be a way to explain why intervention is effective or for whom intervention is effective. And, and for whom is particularly interesting to me because we can think about pre-treatment variables that might be able to match children with specific interventions that are more likely to be effective prior to starting that intervention. So can we look at these vocal variables to say, a child is displaying this set of skills, they're more likely to benefit from this treatment, we're gonna start there and then evaluate, rather than just starting with one treatment or another, trying it for six months and then changing. In order to pursue any of those potential purposes for assessing or targeting vocal development, we have to be able to assess vocal development in a valid manner. And thinking about how to um, evaluate vocal development, there are a number of potentially important aspects of vocal development. And so I'll be presenting four aspects of vocal development that will follow throughout this presentation. And we'll be coming back to those over and over again. And the first aspect we can consider is volubility. That's simply how often the child produces vocalizations. So it's making sounds with their vocal folds on the release of air. We can also consider the communicative use of vocalization. So in that video, you saw them using that canonical battle in a clearly communicative manner. So an intended message directed towards another individual. We can also consider the vocal complexity of these productions. So does it include canonical syllables? Are there vowels included? Or are there consonants included? What's the diversity of consonants within their production? There's a number of ways to think about the overall complexity. And finally, we have vocal reciprocity, and that's getting at the back and forth nature of conversation. In this case, the back and forth nature of vocalizations as a foundation towards conversation. We specifically define vocal reciprocity as the degree to which an adult vocal response to a child's vocalization 
increases the probability of an immediately following child vocalization. So it's this pattern of a child vocalization followed by an adult vocalization followed by a child vocalization without an interrupting event. And so you're looking at that likelihood relative to chance. Is it more likely uh, than chance for that child to produce a vocalization after an adult response? And for any of these variables, um, we need to look for both theoretical and empirical support. And we have three converging theories that provide support for those four different aspects. Um, and they all emphasize the role of the caregiver and the child and their interaction between them in supporting vocal development. And so I'm briefly going to describe um, each of these theories. So the first is the social feedback theory, which was put forth by Goldstein and colleagues in 2003 and 2008 for children with typical development. And it really emphasizes those contingent carrier responses to child vocalization, so how the caregiver is responding to child when they vocalize, and, and depending on specific characteristics of those vocalizations. And then World Mountain colleagues in 2014 applied this, a similar model called a social feedback loop directly to children with autism spectrum disorder. So they assert that um, adults are more likely to respond to child vocalizations that are speech-like and those that are non-speech-like, and that children are more likely to respond to the adult's response if they've just responded to the child's vocalization than if they haven't. And so for children with autism spectrum disorder, this uh, social um, feedback loop can be disrupted in two primary ways. The first is that children with autism spectrum disorder might produce fewer speech-like or total vocalizations, so there's less for the adult to respond to, or the adult could respond differently to children with autism spectrum disorder than children with typical development. The next is the speech attunement framework. So this asserts that the child has to tune in or attend to and tune up, which is to broadly emulate, the general characteristics of the community's spoken language. And this um, development might be particularly difficult for children with autism spectrum disorder because of those deficits in social responsivity, so difficulty tuning in and tuning up. And then finally, we have the transactional theory of spoken language development. And this theory emphasizes child, caregiver, and dyadic factors with an emphasis on the bi-directional nature between those different factors. And essentially, as the child's speech or language skills, and that includes vocal development, increase, the adult provides more complex input to scaffold continued development upward over, over the course of development. So if we consider each of these different aspects of vocalizations broadly, so we certainly can look at um, different relations more specifically. I'm going to give kind of a general um, broad stroke of how um, these variables can interact together. So if we see an increase in general vocal development measured by volubility, communicative use, complexity, and reciprocity, it can indicate characteristics about the child and the adult. So for the child, it could indicate that the child is attempting to talk. They might be trying to produce words so they understand that are not yet readily understood from the child's speech production. It could also indicate from these increases that the child is fine-tuning their production. So they're attempting to say words, they're trying to match them to the adult model, and as they're getting feedback from their own productions and from adult productions, they're able to, to fine-tune uh, their approximations. And we can also see, particularly from increases in reciprocity, that it could be evidence that um, the caregiver's vocal responses are affecting the child, so that they are becoming more in tune to that, child, to that caregiver input to the child's vocalizations. And across all of these um, increases in vocal development, you also see that the caregiver has increased responses, not only to respond more frequently or more consistently, but also with more complex input, as that child's complexity is increasing as well for their vocal productions. In addition to all of this theoretical support and these foundations, we also have empirical support for each of these four different aspects. And today I'm going to focus on a summary of that um, evidence based on a meta-analysis that I completed. And then I'll talk about several more specific studies when I connect the results of this study to those from the extant literature during the discussion. So we completed a meta-analysis on the association between vocalizations and expressive language in young children with autism spectrum disorder. Through our search, we found nine studies that met our inclusion criteria that were described within 19 different reports. There are at least 362 unique participants within those studies. We have a total of 109 effect sizes. Because we had multiple effect sizes per study, we used robust uh, variance estimation for the standard error to account for that. And we came up with a mean correlation of 0.5, which is strong, 
Um, and it was stronger for correlations that are concurrent at 0.77 versus longitudinal at 0.33, which is still notable. We tried to look at a no number of other moderator analyses, so we looked at whether the vocalization measure required the use of consonants, whether the vocalization measure only included communicative vocalizations, along with several, several other moderators, but there weren't enough primary studies to be able to conduct um, those analyses. We were too underpowered. And that's one of the reasons that we went towards um, this dissertation work in looking at generating more primary evidence about how to measure vocal development. So the purpose of this study is to evaluate and compare evidence of validity of vocal variables reported to assess vocal development in young children with autism spectrum disorder. So here we're considering those same four aspects, volubility, communicativeness, complexity, and reciprocity. We asked six research questions. The first is about convergent validity. Does this variable correlate with other variables that it should based on theory? And for that, we're looking at whether the vocal variable predicts later expressive language skills. We're also interested in divergent validity. So is the variable not correlated with other variables that it shouldn't be based on theory? Because we want a specific measure, not a general measure of development. And so here we look at whether the vocal variable does not predict later nonverbal cognitive skills. For the third question, we're examining sensitivity to change. We're looking across 12 months in time, does the variable show change? And a simple question. And then for the final three questions, um, we're looking at incremental validity. And so we're pitting one variable against another to try to help us narrow which of these variables might be best for an intended purpose. And the general framework is we're comparing less elaborate or less costly measures to more elaborate or more costly measures to try to figure out whether these more elaborate or more costly measures provide added value relative to those that are simpler or less expensive. And so we do that through three different comparisons. The first is relative to volubility, which arguably should be the simplest and least expensive. Do measures of communicative use, complexity, or reciprocity provide added value? Next, we're interested in whether um, reciprocal vocal contingency for reciprocity, which involves three events, a child vocalization, adult vocalization, child vocalization, from two different actors, the child and the adult, whether that provides added value relative to communicative use and complexity, which are a single event, single actor variable, so less elaborate. And then third, we're interested in comparing automated versus conventional measures. So automated measures um, are generally less elaborate or costly, and especially less costly than conventional measures that require intensive coding from video samples. That requires a lot of time and expertise. And um, so are those conventional measures accounting for unique variants above and beyond automated measures of the same vocal aspect? And we're able to do that for volubility and for complexity. So to answer these research questions, I used a sample of 87 children with autism spectrum disorder who were 13 to 30 months at study entry. They had developmental quotient mean of about 60 with a large standard deviation of 18. And their receptive and expressive language levels by age equivalency around 10 months and 12 months um, respectively. Okay. There are a lot of measures within this study because it's focused on measurement. And I'll go through each of those and kind of go through them carefully um, but also relatively quickly. So the first aspect is we're measuring volubility, how often the child produces vocalizations. And we do that both through conventional measures and through automated measures. So the conventional measures come through communication samples and we're coding for specific behaviors. For volubility, we're interested in how often the child vocalizes, so how many sounds produced on the release of air. And then we also use the LENA device for day-long audio um, recordings. And so it's those 16-hour samples and we're interested in the number of child speech-related vocalizations during those samples. Um, and we used um, one day from the Lena samples and then um, several communication samples added together. The next aspect is communicative use of vocalizations. And here we cannot use the Lena device because it can't infer communicativeness. So we just use conventional measures. And we have three different variables that we extract from the communication samples. We have the number of intentional communication acts that include a vocalization, and then those that are the number of intentional communication acts that include more specifically a canonical <coughs> syllable, and then the proportion of vocalizations that are communicated. So several different ways to quantify communicativeness. For vocal complexity, we're again able to use both conventional and automated measures. For the conventional measures, we determine the consonant inventory regardless of communicativeness, 
and then specific to those that are the key consonants used in Communication Acts. We also have the proportion of, vocal, of uh, intentional Communication Acts with a canonical syllable, and then the proportion and number of vocalizations with a canonical syllable. So we're interested in metric as well, proportion versus number. And from the LENA device, we use three different uh, measures of complexity available in the literature, which are the average count per utterance of consonants and the average count per utterance of vowels, as well as the infraphonological vocal development score, the IBD score. And last, for vocal reciprocity, we only use an automated measure, um, which is reciprocal vocal contingency, which we've developed um, through our lab. And um, that's using the LENA devices to look at the degree to which that adult vocal response to a child vocalization increases the likelihood of immediately following child vocalization above and beyond chance. So trying to account for that chance occurrence. Okay, so those are all of the vocal variables. We then have two outcome measures that we use in our growth curve models. We have expressive language and nonverbal cognitive skills that we use four different um, scores that we combine together for a more stable estimate of those two constructs. Okay, for the results. And I'll explain my growth curve models within these results um, as pertinent to each research question. And so I will acknowledge that I completed a number of preliminary analyses. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm happy to answer questions about them. But we did check each variable's reliability, as well as remove several redundant vocalization variables from the analyses. And we created several types of composite variables. So the dependent variables, which I just described, as well as combining uh, the different communication samples for conventional coding. And for the automated analysis, we combined the average count per utterance of consonants and the average count per utterance of vowels because they were sufficiently correlated for that complexity measure. The IVD score was not sufficiently correlated with those two to combine. Okay, so this is for research question one, um, where we're interested in whether the vocal variable predicts later expressive language skills. We use growth curve modeling across three different time points that span 12 months, and we centered time at time three. So this is interpretable as the end point for expressive language skills. We used a um, random intercept and a fixed slope. That was the best fitting model for the data. And here we're looking to see whether the vocal variable is a significant predictor of that endpoint expressive um, language skills. And all of the vocal variables are, except for IVD score. In addition to looking at significance, we can also look at the effect size. And so here I'll highlight those with a relatively high effect size. We used a pseudo R squared of 0.25 as our cutoff um, for determining a relatively high or large effect size. And you can see these variables, I have them ordered in the same order I've been discussing them. So we have volubility, communicativeness, complexity, and reciprocity. And so the four highlighted are the communicative use and complexity variables that are measured through conventional means, and that as having large effect sizes. For the second research question, we're interested in divergent validity. So does the var vocal variable not predict later nonverbal cognitive skills? We're looking for a discriminant measure. So here we're looking to see that the vocal variable is not significant as a predictor. And the only one that is, is total number of vocalizations that's measured conventionally. And, and here I should say we used, again, a growth curve model across the three time points, but used a random intercept and a random slope, because that's the best fitting model. So all of the vocal variables except the total number of vocalizations provide evidence of uh, divergent validity. Next, we have the evidence for sensitivity to change. And this, we don't use growth curve models. We're simply doing a pair of two tests from time one to time three across 12 months. Do we see change in this vocal variable? And we do see um, significant change for all of them, except for the IVD score. And we see large effect sizes for the total number of vocalizations, for the number of communication and acts, and the proportion of vocalizations that are communicative. So those are the communicative variables, as well as the conventionally coded complexity variables in one of the automated measures of complexity. Next, we're moving to incremental validity. So this is where we're pitting one variable against another to try to see which provides added value and relative to one of those less complex or uh, less costly variables. And the first is relative to volubility. So arguably the simplest and least expensive aspect of vocalizations to measure. And here, we tried to combine the automated and conventional measures of volubility into a single measure, but they were not sufficiently correlated. So I'll first present the conventional and then the automated results. And so as you can see, we measure and add our measure of communicative use, complexity, and measured conventionally, complexity measured through the automated means, 
and reciprocal vocal contingency, all of those continue to account for unique variance above and beyond volubility when measured conventionally. However, when you use the automated volubility variable, only the communicative use and complexity measure conventionally account for unique variance. Next, we examine the incremental validity of reciprocal vocal contingency. And we see that relative to communicative use and complexity, when measured conventionally, reciprocal vocal contingency does not account for unique variance. It only accounts for unique variance above and beyond the complexity measure um, that was measured um, through the LENA device, the automated measure. And for our final research question, we're interested in hitting the automated versus the conventional measures. And whether these conventionally coded variables that are time consuming and expensive account for added value relative to the automated measures. And we see that both of them do. So for volubility as well as for complexity. And you'll notice that the automated complexity measure becomes no longer significant um, when we add the conventionally coded variable. Okay, now I'm going to try to pull this together. So I'm going to start by saying that there's no agreed upon way to compare the validity of different variables. So I'll present it in several different ways. The first way that we could summarize these results is to look at which variables have consistent evidence of conversion validity, divergent validity, and sensitivity change. And if we do that, so we look for yeses across the board, we see these six variables. So again, the communicative use and complexity variables that are measured conventionally, as well as the average count for utterance, consonants, and vowels, so that <coughs> automated complexity score and reciprocal vocal contingency. I would argue that relying just on yeses puts too much weight on significance testing, and instead we should consider effect sizes. So if we look at those relatively large effect sizes, we see that these four variables um, provide consistent evidence of convergent validity, sensitivity to change, and we don't provide an effect size for divergent validity. And so these are the communicative use and complexity variables that are measured conventionally. We can also consider those that have consistent evidence of convergent and divergent validity, and those same four variables appear as those with the strongest validity. Next, we can consider those that have um, large effect sizes for sensitivity to change, and that might be particularly important when you're considering an outcome measure for an intervention study that you're trying to capture change over time, and you want to put your um, put your weight on the sensitivity to change as the most important evidence of validity. And here you can see the following six variables and um, provide a large effect size for sensitivity to change. Now returning to the incremental validity analyses, we did see that communicative use and conventionally coded complexity composites exhibit incremental validity relative to volubility, regardless of how volubility is measured. But the automated variables, um, it depended on what type of volubility measure they were compared with. They only provided incremental validity relative to the conventionally coded volubility variable. For reciprocal vocal contingency, it did not exhibit incremental validity relative to conventionally coded communicative use or complexity measures. And then we see that it did provide incremental validity relative to the automated measure of complexity. And finally, in comparing the incremental validity for automated versus conventional variables, the conventional variables did account for unique variance above and beyond the analogous variables for volubility and complexity that were automated. Right. So overall, um, I would assert that these variables highlight the value of considering communicative use and complexity of vocalizations when evaluating vocal development in young children with autism spectrum disorder. And um, caution is warranted for the use of um, automated measures that we looked at here, particularly for IVD score. And we're still investigating why IVD um, did not show strong or um, showed little evidence of validity within this sample, um, where it has shown stronger evidence within other validity um, tests and other samples. And so if we look at these results relative to the literature, kind of place this within the context, you can see that we have, um, here are each of the variables that we tested within our study or in the first column. And then we have other studies that have provided evidence for that same vocal variable, evidence of convergent validity with expressive language. And we have a number of those available for convergent validity, and um, though we did add several novel findings to the literature. But for divergent validity, we see a lot of blank space within that co column. We only found one study, just for reciprocal vocal contingency. And we were able to replicate that evidence for divergent um, validity. However, um, it is for a different, a slightly different variable um, of the, 
the node. So we used nonverbal IQ, the other study had used different um, outcome measures. And last we have for sensitivity change, we see a number of replications we were able to find um, there as well. There are several um, limitations to acknowledge and to consider for the future. The first is that we know replication is required to extend the results to other data collection methods, uses, and populations because validity is restricted um, to those features. We also acknowledge that we use multiple significant tests per research question, so that increases the likelihood of our type 1 error. However, given the number of replications we were able to generate, we would assert that it is unlikely that all of the findings are due only to elevated type 1 error. We also recognize that we only had one lane of reporting per child per time period, so that may have reduced the stability of those vocal variables, and we don't have a way to quantify the level of stability with a single sample within the study. Um, next, we see that we were not always able to make clear distinctions between variables that were of communicative use versus complexity. So some of those really include both concepts, including diversity of key consonants and communication acts. That has both a complexity and a communicativeness component. And then we also see that, um, recognize that we use correlational and single group pre-post designs so we can't make causal inferences based on these findings. Our implications that we provide support for measuring communicative use and complexity when assessing vocal development in young children with autism spectrum disorder. And we have um, multiple pieces of evidence for selecting variables that are most likely to capture the phenomenon of interest. And I think this is particularly important when we think about submitting grants and arguing for the resources we need. So demonstrating um, the value in these conventionally coded variables that are expensive and time consuming. Those are going to increase our results of demonstrating that an intervention is effective to making that argument within um, a grant proposal or other kind of funding argument. Um, and they also provided um, those different pieces to help us evaluate for a specific purpose which of these pieces of validity evidence are we going to weigh more heavily than others. So in thinking about moving this research forward and in a programmatic way, I'm interested in determining ways to target um, pre-linguistic vocalizations and seeing whether we can move children's language trajectory to a higher rate by first examining these pre-linguistic vocalizations. And so looking to see what is malleable. That will likely look like some small single case designs or small group designs to examine malleability of these different types of variables um, and then progressing towards um, later language goals. Within those studies, I'm likely to measure communicative use and complexity um, conventionally at this point and having judicious use of those automated measures. So still trying to figure out um, how we can take advantage of these automated measures for specific purposes um, and how they can be refined um, to increase their validity um, and their use um, within studies in a meaningful way. And then my other piece, as I mentioned in my introduction, so I've been interested in children with hearing loss and how to support those children for a number of years. And I think many of these vocalization variables can be translated to children with hearing loss, and of course additional research is required. And, but particularly thinking about children with cochlear implants or children with hearing loss at a very young age, trying to look at their vocal development as they're um, acquiring words and maybe one way to evaluate the effectiveness of cochlear implants in these young children to look at their um, development soon after implantation when we know we're still waiting before words are likely to develop, but can we have our intervention be informed by those vocal changes um, when it's too early to, to make judgments based on spoken words. So I'm going to conclude with a number of acknowledgements. So of course, first and foremost, to all the children and families who participated in these studies to make them possible, as well as to my mentors and committee members through my doctoral training and to co-authors and collaborators and to reliability coders, particularly those who coded those conventional variables for a very long time. Um, and to my other um, lab mates. And then I will acknowledge um, that my doctoral program was funded by the U.S. Department of Education, and, and I have received funding from the Ash Foundation and the Vanderbilt um, Institute for Translational Research. They didn't fund this specific project, but have found funded work that is foundational to this line. And so now I'm happy to take your questions. Um, in terms of the, uh, I have a procedural kind of question. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mary, how many kids did you have again? 87. 87. And um, for your sensitivity to change, did you control for intervention? 
So I tested to see whether there's an effect. Um, so these were within an intervention study, and so I checked for any moderators. And they all had the same intervention? So they had two different interventions and two intensities, but there were not any moderator effects for either of those variables. It's not too good for the intervention <laughs> part. So, <laughs> so not my research questions, right, 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 and right, so right. yeah, the primary analyses are to be included. So um, yes, there were, but there weren't differential effects um, for the globalization variables across those, those different groups. So, um, <clears throat> I have a question about, so I haven't seen very many studies that talk about divergent validity, actually. Right. I think that's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, so, talk about that a little bit in terms of um, what the future might be of using measures like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't usually see that. Right, yes. And so this came out of my work kind of in early training in psychometrics, that we talked a lot about convergent validity and divergent validity, mm -hmm. so the core of construct validity. Um, and I asked a lot of questions about why we don't see divergent validity. I think one of the pieces is that it sounds good in theory, but it's really hard to find um, a good divergent node because we know, especially in young children, a lot of aspects of development are correlated together. So I did find that this divergent question I thought was a risky one to ask because I, I thought we would um, find correlations even if they weren't. Um, so that they might be significant even though they weren't clinically meaningful. Um, but I think the value in it is showing that uh, the variable is specific to what it's saying it's measuring. We're not looking for an overall gross developmental measure, but the, this is specific right. to vocal development. Um, and hopefully others will, will follow and um, provide some more specific measures about um, the, the practice we're looking at. Because I think then being able to tease apart why, say for instance, diversity of key consonants is predictive of expressive language. So think about that construct and we're saying it's not by general development. So what are the other possible reasons for that correlation? Okay. So I think you mentioned that the IDE measure was perhaps unstable because you only had one recording from the Lumina device, right? So it's possible that it is. We don't, we can't determine that from our data set. Other data sets have found it stable in a single sample. And um, so that's kind of our, we're taking a guess. Um, but it's possible um, that it's not. You need two measures, two days to be able to tell if it's stable. Well, so I was wondering if you had enough data to split your day in half um, and take some of the waking periods from the early in the day where someone might have just gotten used to the Lena device versus later in the day where they are used to it and you know, the novelty has worn off. Um, and compare those two to see if the measures are the same or if there actually is a change as a result of it going acclimated to them. Mm -hmm. So to be able to split kind of those ITS files in half. Yeah, that would be an interesting way to see if um, we can find a reason for that stability or instability. So, so just playing off of that a little bit mm -hmm. in terms of all of your readers. So, I mean, obviously you can listen to this and go, well, this has a lot of clinical, mm -hmm. a clinical validity yet, maybe not, mm -hmm. but clinical op opportunities mm -hmm. to sort of hone this into something that could be um, where the data could be gathered in a way that's pretty efficient, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So right. a question about this, um, how, how many, to get, to get the data you got, how, how many hours and how much analysis was required? I'm just thinking um, about this from a standpoint. For the conventionally coded yeah. measures, yeah. Right. so conventionally coded we had one 10-minute sample and then three six-minute samples, so we have 28 and minutes of recording mm -hmm. per child mm -hmm. per um, time period. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say once you're consistent at coding that, you can code that amount of data. Still takes an hour or two mm -hmm. um, to code that time point. Right. Versus reciprocal vocal contingency, I can do an entire time point for the whole sample in under, in about an hour or less, mm -hmm. once the data is organized. So that doesn't include the collection, the uploading. Um, but I think my question um, that needs to be tested empirically for clinical practice is which of these can be coded live reliably. Sure, sure. And so if you could do diversity of key consonants um, in communication acts, that's one possibility, though determining communicativeness of communication acts in young children with autism is challenging. So yeah. potentially proportion of vocalizations that have a canonical syllable yeah. that also had relatively high validity yeah. across each of those might be more likely. So have the parent and child interact for X number of minutes and mark um, which vocalizations have canonical syllables. Um, I think we have had success training undergraduate students to be able to do that. 
Um, so it would be hopeful that that speech language pathologist would be able to learn that relatively quickly. Um, I think it's then a matter of demonstrating the usefulness of that variable relative to other ways you would spend right. that amount of time within a session. Can you talk a little bit about your ideas for targeting prelinguistic vocalizations in, um, in an intervention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've started to think about this and how to kind of map out um, some work. And I, a lot of the, the research comes back to these contingent responses. And so I think contingent responses has a, um, I would like to be able to test that empirically. And then you still need a way to get that child to initially vocalize so that there is something for the child or the adult to respond to. So. Um, and that's an area that I'm still kind of thinking about and whether there are particular activities or toys that are particularly engaging for a child that are sound related that you can then shape, even if that starts with laughter or an initial response, but you have to get something to get that volubility um, going initially. And so I would like to be able to test that within a single case um, design. I can figure out exactly the design that, that's right that doesn't have the carryover effects that have been much of a challenge within the, the literature for testing those contingent responses. Um, and then having that um, protocol for how the caregiver responds um, contingently as well. It seems like with some of those, obviously I'm not a speech or a language person, but it seems like with some of those contingent responses, um, the communicative at, at intent could be really difficult for the caregiver to pick up on. Mm -hmm. And so, do you know, like are there certain factors like affect or eye contact or different things that can help with that or because I can imagine that there are probably a range of parental or caregiver skills with understanding those things. Right. So when we look at it from a laboratory context, we can consider attention to the other individual and to the event. So that can be through eye gaze, that can be through a gesture, it can be through touching. And so trying to look at both of those attention to the adult and to the other the object or the event. But you're right, that is a challenging um, task to ask caregivers to do. So whether there is a way for us to have those responses, and um, whether they need to be contingent on communicativeness, whether they need to be contingent on what the vocalization is. So we're going to be um, more reinforcing to a specific type of vocalization. Right, um, so you're just responding to all vocalizations versus specific. Because if I'm responding to every screen, then I may be reinforcing a behavior that I don't want to right. Yes, and then also thinking about the, the type of response that you give, so you might respond to, to each communicative attempt of the child, even if it's not directed, but if it is related to the ongoing activity, then you're going to spot respond with a linguistic map. So trying to kind of tease out when to respond and how to respond. Okay, so this is kind of relating to my question and then something that Nancy asked as follow-up, and now I'm trying to understand what's going on in your data. So with your vocal measures and your growth curves for the expressive language, um, so there were no intervention effects, but you saw growth. So there weren't differential effects between the interventions. Okay, but you still saw There's a growth. Like gone. They all went. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah. the slopes might be different from the two interventions, but they were not um, significantly different. So what were those changes, and what did they look like? For the, um, the amount of growth yeah. across them. And so I can't um, give you specific means on those. I'm going to follow <laughs> up um, on that. Um, we did see, um, so across each of the variables, we did see clear growth in them at a group level. And um, so of course, there's always going to be variation. Um, but there's a clear shift from many near zero um, values on the vocalizations to certainly spreading um, to a more uh, bell curve or normalized distribution shifting um, upward. And, and I think for the different um, variables, the, the increment of change is different. And these results are um, a little um, more challenging to interpret because we used z-scores on each of them. And we transformed them to z-scores in order to combine to make those composites. So there are a few renditions um, of analysis to kind of peel back those specific units of change. I will say that within that larger intervention um, trial, they have found some differential effects. They just weren't on these specific variables, which are secondary measures to the primary ones of the intervention sure. study. Um, and so they were able to, I'm, just, I'm grateful to be able to use the piece of the data that I'm given.
Did you look at, have you looked at vowels? Or do you have any ideas about vowels? You notice some really different, and especially if you're looking at kids with autism and kids with hearing loss, I just think there's a lot, lot in the vowels. So. Yes, that's a um, great area for future exploration. We haven't looked at those specifically within these productions. Um, other than we could see which, um, what proportion had only vowels, because we have, or that had the, um, we would have data on which ones have consonants. We transcribe the children's words and attempts, and it's amazing how many vowel errors there mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think for a number of our children, because they're in communication samples, it's often unknown what the target is. Right. So yeah. I don't think we can have vowel accuracy. We might be able to look at vowel diversity, sure. or yeah. even looking at some of the, you know, how reliably can these vowels be, or are they somewhat in between. Yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the automated versus conventional that you're looking at. I mean, I know that you showed that this was some of the measures that the conventional did something mm -hmm. on top of the yeah. um, automated and the have yeah. dropped out. But are there, um, so how do you see, is, is the automated just a way of collecting a larger volume that's easier to, to, to code and analyze, or are there some unique things that you're getting there, uh, for instance? of a different context. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I'm happy to elaborate on that. Um, so I, I think what the, the analyses broadly show me is that we need to be um, really thoughtful in the way that we're selecting different measures. And we're going to have certain goals and certain um, aspects are going to be feasible for different projects. And that's going to inform which measures you're choosing. For the automated measures, and um, for cerebral vocal contingency, for example, that is, we don't have probably is a way to do that conventionally, but we didn't have a, a feasible and empirically and theoretically driven method um, for deriving that variable. Um, so reciprocity, um, if we're looking at it, we've only considered it through the automated um, measures. And the advantage of the Lena device and why it comes up as so appealing is the vast amount of data that you can collect for so little cost. Um, but figuring out how to generate a variable that is more meaningful than a conventionally coded or is going to be likely to yield um, a result is what, what the question is. And I think one of the initial steps is to consider how much data do you need. So for us, 16 hours may not have been enough for some of the variables. And we found that in others. So reciprocal vocal contingency, some samples, one is enough. Others, we need two, two days. Um, and for some Lena variables, you need more than two, um, especially for the adult um, measures, um, child measures within stable. It's and lower numbers. And um, so that, that stability piece is a big question. And we've also tried to manipulate um, the sampling context of the Lena device, so for reciprocal vocal contingency. Um, and trying to improve that measure, we tested whether if you remove the long sections of pauses. So if you look within the Lena system, you'll see, you can see time blocks, and you'll see long gaps where there's no child vocalizations, there's no adult vocalizations, it's silence. And, and for example, we'd see a lot of that from 1 to 3 p.m. The child is likely napping. Um, whether the device is on them or beside them, we don't know. Um, but that's not a, necessarily a valid context for measuring vocal development. So in our uh, automated attempt at refining the sampling context, we then had a program that would remove those long stretches of pauses at different intervals. So we did 15 minute pauses, 30 minutes of pause time, 45, 90, 60, 90, I think, up by 30 or 60 minute increments up until four hours. So to take those pauses out, which we were attempting essentially to account for sleep time, and then we didn't want to sample it when they're sleeping, because some of those recorders stay on from 7 p.m. to midnight, the child is asleep. Um, but it didn't improve our correlation with expressive language. That was an effective mean for kind of cleaning out that signal to noise ratio. So we're still trying to rack our brain to figure out if there's another way to, to improve that signal to noise and a ratio within this mass amount of, of data. Um, and so um, I think just being able to kind of weigh those options and think about the, the variables that might be meaningful. Uh, the other piece is to consider how many variables you want to generate and what's the relative cost of each of those. So if you're already measuring Lena variables, there's not a lot of added cost to additional analyses on those, but if you consider I'm going to conventional and I might add this one Lena variable that has a relatively higher cost addition to the conventional. So I think one of the directions I'd like to consider is what are these different packages of variables that you might consider and what's the, 
the kind of cost benefit ratio of some of those different packages of variables. So a question, Joe, is this a, a preview of your program of research or is this a part of your program of research because I know you're interested in the intervention research itself. So mm -hmm. Where does this fit? Yeah, so then I see this is foundational to intervention research and figuring out how we measure right. vocal development because if we don't know what we're measuring, right. then it's really challenging to figure out if our intervention is working <laughs> and, and to really think critically um, about the variables and then be able to argue um, through through grants and, and other um, other means what I need um, to measure in what way to be successful and increase the likelihood of finding um, meaningful change. And, so, and I imagine there are some other analyses within this um, sure. as I go that I'll, I'll find to, to be useful. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention.